it's so ridiculously thick. This book is huge. I mean, look at this. I can barely pick it up. Wow, wow, it's heavy too. Handbook of Physics, Condon and Ottershaw. The amount of knowledge in a book like this is completely ridiculous. Look how thick that is. And it's weird because like, it's not a soft cover, but it's not really a hard cover. It's kind of like an in-between cover. It's a little bit soft and a little bit hard. Let's open it up and see what's inside this book. Handbook of Physics. This book probably contains, I wanna say everything, but that's not possible, but a lot of stuff. Prepared by a staff of specialists, edited by E.U. Condon and Hugh Odishaw. So these are the people who edited the book. And there are uh, where they have worked or where they do work. Wayman Crow Professor of Physics, Washington University, St. Louis. That's a really good school. Former director of National Bureau of Standards, Washington, D.C. Then we have Hugh Odishaw, Executive Director, U.S. National Committee for the International Geophysical Year. Wow. National Academy of Sciences, Washington, D.C. And former assistant to the director at National Bureau of Standards, Washington, D.C. So that's probably how they know each other, right? Condon and Odisha. I guess they were really good friends. 1958. Wow. So long ago. Like, think about it, right? We are in 20... 24 now, so 1958 was such a long time ago. I'm sorry, I just gotta give it a whiff. It's intoxicating, I can smell it, and I'm pretty far away. I just gotta, I just gotta give it a whiff here because it's just, ah, oh, the smell of knowledge. And these are all of the contributors who contributed to this tome of physics, to this epic physics book, which contains so much knowledge. Look at all these people, all of these physicists, wow. Oh wow, Brookhaven National Laboratory. Interesting, um, I have several physics books uh, that belonged to a nuclear physicist who actually worked at Brookhaven uh, probably around this time actually. So this person probably knew um, and probably worked with uh, the person's books that I own. Random, random fact, when you collect books, you start to look at the history of the books and who owned them and it's really interesting. You know, I have books that math teachers gave to other math teachers in the 60s. You know, it's just really, really weird. Look at this, there's even more names, so many names. And here, here's the preface, here's what this book is about. Let's take a moment to, to read, it, read this. This book was first planned nearly 10 years ago when we were closely associated at the National Bureau of Standards. So I was right, that's where they did meet. We set ourselves the problem of making a judicious selection from the vast literature of physics of materials which might reasonably be called what every physicist should know. Interesting, so it's like a, uh, a compilation. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the page here, and here you can see everything it contains. So part one is mathematics. Look at this, arithmetic, algebra, wow, analysis, differential equations, partial differential equations. Some of these are pretty big names too. I recognize these names, Fritz John, I have, I have, I feel like I have some other things by Fritz John. Here's some more topics here. Look at all this. Mechanics of particles and rigid bodies, kinematics. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It just contains tons of knowledge. I mean, it's just so much, so much. Look at this, it's still, I'm still turning the page. We're still on the content. You can spend an hour going through the content. It's just ridiculous. So here's part one, the mathematics. This is a math channel, so let's take a look at some of this stuff. Oh, there's Newton's method. That's pretty cool. This is a method that is taught in Calculus 1, and this is the formula. I'm going to zoom in here so you can see it a little bit better. This is the formula that Calc 1 students usually have to memorize if, if they're being taught this. A lot of teachers, um, I feel that they don't cover Newton's method because it's one of those oddball things. It takes class time and but I personally like covering it. Um, it's a really cool to explain the derivation and explain what it's for. Uh, you can use it to approximate uh, x-intercepts, right? It's pretty cool, using tangent lines, right? So basically each tangent line gets closer and closer and closer to um, the intercept. Pretty cool. And it's explained here in this book. Some other numerical methods for finding the inverse of a matrix. Yeah, this stuff takes a lot of time to get good at. 
you learn some of this stuff in like pre-calc and in linear algebra. That's when you deal with uh, that matrix stuff. Let's jump ahead to some physics. It says principles of thermodynamics, chapter one, the nature of heat. See what it says here. Heat is a form of energy associated with random and chaotic motions of the molecules of which matter is composed. It is therefore fundamentally measured in mechanical energy units, such as ergs or joules. Cool. And here's the first law of thermodynamics. Consists simply in the recognition that heat is a form of energy and therefore has to be included in reckoning changes in the internal energy content of the system. The law asserts that the system processes an internal energy content U, which is a function of the variables necessary to specify the state. Very to the point, very direct, probably not like the best book uh, for self-study. It's, it's just meant to be like a book of knowledge. It basically contains tons of physics and tons of mathematics. Really nice. The book does have some cool diagrams and stuff, which I think is really cool because this book was published long ago. So I, I think that these things took a lot more work to add to books, you know, these designs and things. I'm assuming that they were done by hand. I don't know much about, um, you know, the book printing business and specifically how it was done back then. Um, but yeah, really impressive, you know, before the age of, you know, computers, you know, they didn't even have, they didn't have cell phones back then or computers or anything. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago, 1958. Dielectrics by A. Von Hippel, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Electric circuits. A lot of these things um, you would learn in basic physics classes. So like if you go to college and you take physics, there's usually three. I actually took all three, physics one, two, and three. Believe it or not, three was actually required uh, at the time uh, when I got my bachelor's. Uh, it's no longer required. They've changed the requirement since then. And um, yeah, they've dropped it. But it was required when I took it. And physics three was actually the one that I got an A in. The other ones I got uh, Bs in or B pluses. It's, it's a hard class. It's hard because not only do you have to be good at mathematics, right? But you have to uh, know the laws of physics and how to apply the formulas and, you know, what formula to use and how to use it. You really have to understand everything in order to solve the physics problems. And I think that the best way to get good at physics is by doing lots of physics problems. That's really what it comes down to. Oh, wow, look at all that. Really cool. I'm going to zoom in here so you can see some of these equations. Most statistical texts see Fisher and Yates and Pearson and Hartley tabulate values of f sub p such that cool you know this is elements of probability here this is the probability section probability is also one of those things that a, a lot of people don't really like a lot of math majors don't uh aren't really into probability and statistics sampling distributions that's useful stuff that's like a whole other beast i mean if you think about it Mathematics is different from physics because, you know, you can get a degree in math or you can get a degree in physics. At the same time, you can also get a degree in statistics. So it's completely different. So that's why I think a lot of people, um, you know, it's hard to be really focused and really good at more than one thing. Most people can just focus on one thing. And in order to get good at any of these things, math, statistics, or physics, because they're so hard, you really have to give it your 100%. And so it's hard to do that when you're trying to learn many different topics. So, yeah. Wow, all this math. Anyways, awesome book. Uh, if I can find it, I'll leave a link in the description. I don't know if it's still in print. It probably is, or there's probably some used copies. Uh, warning, if you do get it, it is very heavy. It's a very heavy book. It's super thick. Oh, if you want to learn math, I do have math courses. Check out my website, freemathvids.com or mathsorcerer.com. I'll put a link in the description. I've got courses on algebra, calculus, some proof writing stuff, some advanced calculus, some abstract algebra. I don't have a physics course, but I do have uh, math courses. And if you found any value from this content, feel free to subscribe if you want to. And I got to give it another whiff here because it just smells so good. Just, oh, amazing. If you take away anything from this video, it should be that this book is super thick and it's got a ton of stuff in it. If you can find a used copy, I mean, it's worth money, I think, simply because it's heavy. <laughs> like the paper content of this book has to be worth something. No, it's... Things like this are priceless. Just the amount of knowledge you can get from a book like this is incredible.
Until next time, keep doing mathematics.